slippery, which is a beautiful thing. We don't even have a lake that we have to walk over at the bottom of the sidewalk. Just a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, first, we've got the Men of Faith are meeting tomorrow morning at 8.30 at Maple Manor for breakfast. And uh, doing some devotions and talking about uh, accountability to each other. So the guys are getting together at 8.30 at Maple Manor tomorrow morning. Tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock, Hannah's Hands will be meeting downstairs right here. So the guys and, and the gals all have got something to do tomorrow night. Uh, and tomorrow morning. Also, we've got a new service series that started last week that's going to be going for about six weeks. Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock. Getting to know God. We're going to be looking at the attributes of God and uh, in that process of finding out about Him getting closer in our worship to Him. Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. Preceding that at 6 p.m. then we have our our Bible studies that we have where we discuss and take a closer look and dig deeper into God's Word, looking at the uh, gospel lesson from the previous Sunday. So if you're here today, we're going to talk about Wednesday at 6 p.m. So come on up for that also. On May 4th, from 8.30 a.m. to 3 p.m. at Stanford Lutheran Church, there's going to be a women's conference Mind, body, and spirit, allowing God to perfect us. There's going to be prayers and devotions, inspirational messages, fellowship, door prizes, and I'm sure there's going to be a little bit of food there. Just, just think, this is the loser. Yeah. So, some information on that downstairs. Also, um, contact uh, Elaine. Is there anybody? Who, oh, okay. Elaine's kind of heading that up. Talk to her. There's a sign up downstairs also for that. April 17th, coming up in a couple weeks, we're going to have our next healing service. So those of you who have been here before and have felt the, uh, the, the presence of God and the Holy Spirit on that, uh, I encourage you to come on that on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m., April 17th, and just it is soaking in God's presence. So put that on your calendar. As you can see, we have some lilies left. Please bring them home. <laughs> you know, it smells lovely, but you know, it's going to come a point when the bats are not going to be able to give them a drink anymore. So, <laughs> so, take them home with you, plant them, put them wherever you want, uh, but let's get them out of here. Okay, that's about the announcements I have for today. Let's go ahead and get into worship. Our opening hymn for today is Shall We Gather at the River? We're in the, the blue hymnal, number 690. Please rise as you are able.
of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will cleanse us from all unrighteousness and forgive all of our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake, forgives us all of our sins. As a call in our day minister of the Church of Christ and Lutheran Congregations and Mission for Christ, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins by God's authority. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. 
celebrated with joy the festival of our Lord's resurrection. Graciously help us to show the power of the resurrection in all that we do and say. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. lesson this morning is from Acts 5, chapter 5, verses 12 through 20. <clears throat> the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colony. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats, so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. Here ends the reading of the first lesson. The psalm this morning is Psalm 148, found in your hymnals on page 288. I'll read the odd numbers. If you would respond with the even. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all you angels of his. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise, Praise him, heaven and heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He made them stand fast forever and ever. He gave them a law which shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and fog, tempestuous wind, doing his will. <clears throat> Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Wild beasts and all cattle, creeping things and winged birds. Kings of the earth and all, pe and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the world. Young men and maidens, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name only is exalted. His splen splendor is over earth and heaven. He has raised up strength for his people and, and praise for all his loyal servants. The children of Israel, a people who are near him. Hallelujah. The second lesson this morning is from the book of Revelations, chapter 1, verses 4 through 18. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his, his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is faithful, is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and fathers. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty One like the Son of Man. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering of the kingdom, and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, 
was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll when you what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he had seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Here is the reading of the lessons. The second lesson, please rise for the gospel. portrait of God 
And when he is done, God's picture will look exactly like a picture of Jesus. John is saying, they will know what God looks like when I get through. John affirms this at the end of our text for today in verses 30 through 31. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. <coughs> One way John shows us what God is like is through the life of Thomas as he journeys from doubt to faith. Thomas is perhaps the, the least understood and the, the most maligned of all of the disciples. Yet, there's no one else quite like Thomas. He's a natural skeptic, which often led to pe uh, pessimism. He's the kind of person who sees problems more clearly than he sees solutions. Thomas wants to understand everything before he will believe in anything. So let's take a look at the personality profile of this doubting Thomas. Almost everything we know about Thomas is found in the Gospel of John. Now, John's main concern in his Gospel is to move people from doubt to faith. So Thomas is a natural study. In John chapter 11, Jesus has just informed the disciples of the death of the friend Lazarus and then tells them that he is going to Bethany to raise him from the dead. <clears throat> However, the disciples are very much aware that Bethany is just a few miles from Jerusalem and the officials there were seeking to put Jesus to death. Going there will mean that all of them will be placed in harm's way. So the rest of the disciples just sit in stunned silence at Jesus' announcement. Their minds are, are filled with fear and uncertainty. Then John writes in verse 16, Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. In effect, Thomas is saying, We're all going to die. Well, I just know it. We might as well go and get it over with. Thomas always expects the worst. However, this time his pessimism was rooted in reality. Yet, yet to his credit, Thomas is, at this point, willing to go and die with Jesus. That's more than the others seem to be ready to do. The next time we see Thomas is in the upper room where Jesus and his disciples have just eaten their last supper together. Judas has left their company to begin his journey of betrayal. And it is at this point that Jesus unveils his heart as he speaks openly to his friends in the Gospel of John chapter 14. Jesus tells them that he will not be with them much longer. And Jesus says to his disciples in verses 1 through 4, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. At this point, Thomas has had about all he can take. He nearly shouts out in frustration in verse 5, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus' simple reply is, I am the Thomas is silenced. However, his mind is still whirling with objections and arguments. We all know many people like Thomas. Their minds are filled with debates and disagreements. Questions become more important than answers. 
even when you present the, the most rational argument possible, it does not satisfy them. These doubters believe their objections to be insurmountable. And they may even feel that they would be dishonest with themselves by bringing closure to their quest. The problem is that these doubters are on a continuous quest that never comes to a place of discovery. They are always seeking, but never finding. Always asking, but never receiving. Yet, doubt is not always foolish. In fact, if it is the honest doubt, this doubt may actually lead to faith, as it did in the case of Thomas. However, the difference between a dishonest and honest doubt is the willingness to accept evidence when it is given. History, for instance, is literally patched together by doubt, and there could be no progress without it. Galileo doubted that the earth stood still. Copernicus doubted that the earth was the center of the universe. And Columbus doubted that the earth was flat. There's nothing wrong with asking questions and even doubting. It means you're thinking. And in Thomas's case, his skepticism did eventually lead to faith. Thomas had some honest doubts. However, there came a time when he had to be told that it was time to set his doubts aside and stop letting them keep him from the truth. So let's picture the scene. Jesus has risen from the dead and he has appeared to several of the disciples already. However, Thomas has not seen Jesus alive because he prepared, he, uh, he preferred to be alone with his sorrow. And that was a great mistake by Thomas because doubt and despair grows even worse when we are isolated from other believers. But now, Thomas is again with the disciples and they are huddled in a room that's locked with locked doors, afraid that the authorities would soon be after them. John tells the story like this in verses 24 through 27. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hands into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. These words of Jesus of stop doubting and believe are the key words of this passage. In actuality, they, they really are the key words of John's gospel. The Greek word used here for the word believe is the word pistos, which actually means to be thankful. The version of the Bible called the New Living Translation says verse 27 this way, Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. The interesting thing is that Scripture never says anything about Thomas accepting Jesus' invitation to touch his wounds so that he might believe. That's because Thomas now knew there was no longer any need to touch Jesus' scars. So Thomas simply falls on his knees and says, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus tells Thomas in verse 29, <laughs> Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. There is a time and place for honest doubt that includes searching for the truth. However, there comes a time when doubt must give way to faith. 
If your questions lead you to dig for truth and search for meaning, then doubt has served its good purpose. Because the, the truth is, if we believed everything that came down the pipe, we would not be people of faith. We would simply be naive. We'd be like the people who believe the tabloid headlines would say things like, Mom on diet of only chicken lays huge egg. Or, Adam and Eve's bones found in Asia. Eve was a space alien. Fear, or a faith, is not foolishness. Because it will always, always be able to stand up to investigation and reason. The reason the Christian faith has grown from one little band of disciples to the place where it has conquered kingdoms in the hearts of people of every age and every nation is because it is a faith that is based upon truth. This book, the Bible, has inspired, challenged, and changed the lives of people in every land, in every age, and every century. People of all races have come to love Jesus, to put their whole trust in his grace, and have been transformed by his indwelling presence and desire to share him with others. Even people you would not expect have come to know and love our Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you may remember the name Madeline Murray O'Hare who founded the American Atheist Society, and she became so controversial that in 1964, Life magazine referred to her as the most hated woman in America. And Madeline O'Hare went to her grave as an unbeliever. Yet her son, her son William J. Murray, is now a Christian. He is grateful for his newfound faith that, that he's even gone into a ministry to help others experience what he has found in Christ. William's jo new joy in the Lord has obviously given him a sense of humor because he has wrote in his book, My Life Without God. He says that he became a Christian because he couldn't stand the silences after the sneezes. <laughs> The disciple Thomas did not remain a doubter. When Thomas was faced with the truth, he exclaimed, My Lord and my God. Scales fell from Thomas's eyes and a new warmth went into his doubting heart. Love conquered his fears and truth entered his mind. Thomas dropped his doubt to pick up his faith in a new way. And his old pessimism gave way to a new hope. Thomas willingly obeyed Jesus as he stopped doubting and started believing. Folks, don't, don't spend your days as a cynic. Don't let a few doubts keep you from enjoying what you know already to be true. We can all hold some questions in suspense knowing that even though we do not understand them now, there will come a day when we do. The Apostle Paul in the first book of Corinthians, chapter 13, verse 12, says this. I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation. Now we see things imperfectly as in a poor mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me now. You see, folks, the main problem with belief is in reality more of a problem with behavior. If there is a God, then there is someone to whom we are accountable. Doubt is always a resistance to the Lordship of Jesus. It is doubting that Jesus should have the right control in our lives. Even though he created us and gave his life for us. Throughout history there have been many people who have sought to disprove the Christian faith 
and actually ended up embracing it. In the later years of his life, Robert Louis Stevenson was a man of deep and profound faith. However, it was not always that way. <coughs> like many young people, he rebelled against his upbringing. He was raised in Scotland in a very Christian home. As a college student, he quickly shed his right upbringing, which he called the deadliest gag and a wet blanket that could be laid upon a man. He even called himself a youthful atheist. As he became older, however, he began to have doubts about his doubts. He came to see that for all its claim to wisdom, the world has no satisfying answers to the deepest questions of life. Later, Robert Louis Stevenson would ultimately write, there is a God, there is a God who is manifest for those who care to look for him. I believe that it's true. God is here. He is able to be experienced by those who care to seek him. So friends, even if you have doubts, still continue to seek for the truth. And seek for the truth by putting your fingers in the side <coughs> of a Bible and letting the Word of God reveal those truths to give you confirmation and comfort. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you love us even when we have our times of doubt. Help us, Lord, in our unbelief and show us through your holy word the answers for which we are seeking. Then let your Holy Spirit guide us so that we can become the people of faith, faith that you need to spread the good news of your Son Jesus to a world which so desperately needs to hear of your hope and promise. And it is in the holy name of your Son Jesus that we pray. Amen. Our next hymn is Listen, God is Calling in the blue hymnal number 712. <laughs>
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to the judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, we pray for this church. We pray that we stand strong upon your truth and the promises that are within it. Lord, give us strength, not only as we are in here and hear the word, but Lord, let it sink deep into our hearts and minds as we walk out those doors into our mission field to spread that good news of promise and salvation. Lord, in your mercy. In our prayer. Lord, we pray for all those churches who are, who are trying to stand upon that truth and are being bombarded from all around them. Lord, society, the media, and even other churches. Lord, we pray for them to stand strong upon the truth that is within your word and your son Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for all those people who may be in Ill, Ill of health at this time, whether that be in body, mind, or spirit. Lord, give them the strength and healing. Lord, send your Jehovah Rapha down at this time. Bring the healing and strength to all those who are on our hearts that we pray for. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those missionaries that we support as a congregation and also individually. Lord, protect them. Protect their health, Lord, and protect them from any kind of evil. Provide them, Lord, with the resources that they need to do the ministries you have called them to. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for this nation. We pray that we turn back to you. Lord, we are sorry that we have turned away from the promises that our forefathers started in this nation. But Lord, we stand here right now as a congregation and proclaim that it is still it is you that we trust and we are still one nation under God. And so Lord, give us the strength to stand upon that. Lord, in your mercy. But we pray for all of those soldiers who are fighting for those freedoms overseas and are in extreme danger at this time. Father, protect them. Protect their health, Lord. Protect their, protect their minds, protect their emotions, protect their spirit, Lord. Protect them from any kind of evil. And Lord, bring them all home safely to be reunited with their families. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. If anyone has any prayers that they would like to make at this time, please go ahead and say them. Thank you that you are constantly there asking us, calling 
us to go be in your Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. To your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, those who pray for out loud and those prayers that we have in our heart. Trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please share the peace of God with one another.
after supper was finished, he took the cup and he said, this wine is my blood given to you for the forgiveness of sins. This is a new thing I'm doing for you, a new covenant that I am making with you. <coughs> so whenever you drink of this wine, do this in the remembrance of me. Let us all pray together the words that our Lord Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. How we'll celebrate communion today is by intention. We'll give you a wafer which you can dip into the wine, swallow both elements, and you may return to your seat. We have a gluten-free wafer that's in the container in the middle here. Also, in the blue chalice, we have white grape juice. I'll for those who may desire that. All who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are welcome to his table. <coughs> His table is ready. <laughs>
Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.